Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the usable webinar about accessibility for digital security tools. My name is Deanna McCusker, and I'll be your host today. So I am head of user experience at Benetech, and I am responsible not only for the user experience, but also accessibility for our tools. And we got involved with the usable project um, because of our focus on security tools with MARTIS, as well as our expertise in accessibility through our flagship project, Bookshare, which is an electronic library for people with what are called print disabilities. So blindness, low vision, learning disabilities, or motor impairments. And through this, I've become very proficient in accessible and inclusive design. And prior to Benetech, I spent nine years at VMware working on cloud computing, where accessibility was something we were required to do for Section 508 compliance for government contracts. And as a designer, I felt like this requirement hindered my ability to create good user experiences. But in my years at Benetech, I've learned that designing for accessibility can, in fact, improve usability for everyone. And through this webinar, I hope to convince you to embrace this philosophy as well. I was also introduced to the nonprofit world through a three month sabbatical working on uh, user experience for microfinance software. So accessibility can be a win-win. Designing for accessibility often makes your designs more usable by everyone. So I wanted to give you some examples that you're probably familiar with, like curb cutouts, which are those slight ramps that enable wheelchairs to get from the sidewalk down to the street level. And of course, initially these were designed for people in wheelchairs, but they also benefit people pushing strollers or people on bicycles. And likewise, with closed captioning and subtitles that were initially designed for the hearing impaired, they also benefit people who are watching television in public places where the sound might be turned off, or people who speak different languages, they can use the subtitles in their own language. And the last example is website design for font size, color contrast, zoom, and stuff like this that enable people who have less than perfect vision to be able to adjust for their own needs. And as people in the security field, you care a lot about human rights. So I just want to point out that more and more governments are recognizing that disability rights are human rights. Last year at the Usable Forum, the question was asked, are there any people with disabilities who work in human rights? The answer is that there may not be many today, but if our digital tools were more accessible, and not just security tools, but all tools, there will likely be more people with disabilities working in all fields. And as our world becomes more and more digital, it's imperative that we do not unintentionally exclude anyone from participating in productive work, in social media, or even in increasingly digital daily activities such as banking. Oh, and one more thing. I wanted to mention that the acronym for accessibility, A11Y, is because there are 11 letters between the A and the Y, for anybody who's familiar with internationalization, which is I18N. And it also creates the word ally, which is a fun double entendre. So let's all be allies and not enemies of those living with disabilities. So just quickly, the agenda, I want to talk about what is a disability. And this may sound like a stupid question, but I think you'll be surprised by the answer. And then we'll talk about general accessibility guidelines, as well as how accessibility works with security. And lastly, resources and questions. So when you think of disability, you probably think of the traditional disabilities like blindness, deafness, people who are wheelchair bound, or cognitive impairments. And that's because these people often are more dependent, they're either unemployed or underemployed, and they often have very limited educational opportunities, which lends itself to being underemployed as well. But there's also things you should consider, like aging. We're all getting older. Um, Aging-related disabilities are vision loss, hearing loss, things like Alzheimer's, hand tremors, and often multiple disabilities. I had someone articulate this very well to me once who was suffering from both vision loss and hearing loss. And what she said was that the combination of those things impact her ability to comprehend things quickly. 
And so just something to keep in mind that with older adults, they may seem like they're slow or not as smart as they used to be, but it could be that they're just having trouble digesting all of the information that's coming at them because they can't do it as well as they used to be able to. And then there are situational disabilities. We all experience these from one time at one time or another, uh, breaking an arm or a leg, loud or dim environments, for example, a loud or, or very dark restaurant. I don't know how many people have uh, had to pull out their, their phone flashlight in order to read the tiny print on the very dim menus in restaurants. I've had that happen num numerous times. And then, of course, there's always multitasking, and the big example is driving and texting, and we all know that that means when you're driving and texting, you can't do either one perfectly well. And lastly, invisible disabilities. These are things that you aren't even aware someone has unless they tell you. Things like color blindness, learning issues, anxiety, PTSD. And I want to call out eye, uh, eyeglasses because people who have less than 20-20 eyesight, we don't even consider that a disability anymore because we've been able to overcome it with technology. So when you put this all together, there actually are very few people who suffer from severe disabilities, but more than half of us live with conditions that can affect our use of technology on a daily basis. And this is why we should be paying attention to this, not so much for the severe disabilities, but because many of us are dealing with this on a regular basis. So let's get into the general guidelines, um, and we will talk about a little bit of each one of these. So general guidelines for the blind. The blind tend to rely on screen readers and audio because they can't see at all, which is where it becomes imperative that we have alt descriptions for all of our images. We use hierarchy, the HTML hierarchy well. Pages should be ordered logically and not visually because blind people often use the header information and the hierarchy in order to be able to understand to sort of get what the page layout is likely to be. They'll often go through it once and then go back to the top and look at the information. So the more logical you can do this in your HTML, the more e the easier it's going to be for these people to understand the page. Label all fields. The general label for most fields is just the generic label like button or text input. And if you have three buttons at the bottom of the screen that are all labeled button, 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 it's going to be very difficult for the blind person to understand which one is the OK button and which one is the cancel button. Mobile interfaces, you want to be careful of people that do not have good motor control. You want to make sure that things are read out. Sorry, for, for mobile devices for blind, you want to read out items under the touch points so that when people are moving their finger over the screen, they will hear what the objects are under their under their finger. You can try this out on your mobile device. Um, there's a the screen readers are called Talkback on Android and VoiceOver on iOS, and it's much easier to try these out on a mobile device than they are on computers. They're they're harder to use on computers. And lastly, video description. It's not enough just to have dialogue on a movie. You also want there are to be scene descriptions for people who are blind so they understand what's going on on the screen. General guidelines for low vision and dyslexia. Now, I lump these together because poor eyesight and unreliable eyesight are more similar than either one is to blindness. People tend to, to lump blindness and low vision together as visual impairments, but they're really pretty different. People who have any eyesight tend to rely on their eyesight, even if it's unreliable. So the first thing we can do here is to reduce the amount of text. And as it happens, this is better for everyone. If we, as designers and developers, take it upon ourselves to make sure our text is clear and concise and short, then everyone will be able to understand it better. Coarse, large, bold text, good contrast, um, there's there are guidelines on how much contrast is necessary, which are outlined in the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and I'll have a link to that at the end. Um, 
Bold, simple iconography is very important, and we'll get to that in the next slide. You also want to pay attention to color because you want to make sure that you don't use color alone to indicate um, differences because people who are colorblind may not be able to see those differences. And lastly, customizable. The more customizable things are, the more people can adjust them to meet their own needs. So let's take a look at what people see who have low vision. They might see holes in the middle of their vision. They might have blurry peripheral vision. There might be different kinds of blank spots that they see on their screen. And on the lower left with the four panels of, of mobile devices, the one on the right you can see is very blurry. And this is where the large bold iconography becomes really important because someone might be able to look at this and say, oh, it's the green icon with the white dot in the middle, or it's the red icon, but some of the more complex icons won't be as easy to distinguish. And the man, gentleman on the right is using a magnifier to see his own handwriting. So just to give you some idea of the technology that people use. And at the bottom of the screen is a website that you can go to to see some more visual simulations. Dyslexia. So what people think of with dyslexia is usually the mirroring or moving, you know, flipping letters like D's, B's, Q's, and P's. And that kind of dyslexia is trying to be addressed by the open dyslexic typeface, which makes it easier. It's weighted on the bottom and lighter on the top, so it makes it easier for people to distinguish between things like B's and P's, for example. But that's not the only kind of dyslexia. There are people who may not be able to see all of the lines in, let in characters, and so, as in the right top right corner, they may see slightly differently than the letters that are there, which makes it harder and more time-consuming to decipher what they are. And another example, this is just one example of how people with dyslexia might see things, but I wanted to show you this because it's really kind of eye-opening. So here's a web page with a bunch of characters moving around, and you can tell that you could probably make this out eventually if you spend enough time on it. Um, you can see the words eventually, but you might also miss some words or misread some words. So you can see how this can be very difficult with people with dyslexia, and therefore the fewer words that we have, the less likely they are to make mistakes in interpretation. All right, so let's get back to our page here. So I also wanted to give you a visual example of how this matters. Um, it's become very popular lately with website design to use very large but narrow fonts for headers and then to use very small text for the rest of the, the paragraphs. And then when you add this on top of using um, images in backgrounds, this can be very difficult for people to distinguish. So I would encourage you to use much bigger fonts, um, wider fonts for your headers, and then reduce, of course, make sure it's um, very high contrast as well, and reduce the amount of words on the screen. Okay, so that's a couple of guidelines on hearing loss and motor impairment. So for hearing loss, usually computer screens are less problematic for them, but videos should have subtitles and closed captioning, and any audio only should also have text transcripts. And then lastly, for motor impairments, remember that people may not be able to do a lot of fine motor uh, actions, and so we want to have large touch areas on the screen. And you can imagine when you're trying to look at a website that isn't on a mobile device, for example, that does not have a mobile interface, you've got to zoom way in in order to be able to click on certain things. And then people with severe motor impairment may use a switch device on computers, which has very limited options. They can only go forward, backward, or select. And you can imagine how difficult this can be to deal with long passwords, for example. Imagine trying to type in a long password using 
Netflix search where you've got to move back and forth across the keyboard. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about how difficult this can be for certain kinds of disabilities. And lastly, I just want to mention that you should do user testing on your products. Um, it's possible to do simulations. There are simulation software out there that will help you to catch some issues, but I really highly recommend actually testing with disabled users, particularly with screen readers. Screen readers are a skill like Braille or sign language where it can be very difficult to learn and your motivation for learning if you don't need them is very low. So just taking advantage of people who already have those skills is a good idea. The screen readers that are currently most used, JAWS runs on most PCs, um, TalkBack runs on Android, VoiceOver runs on OS X and iOS. And just an example of why this is important, we recently had, we're listening to a screen reader read the, the sentence, pay attention to grammar, there versus there. Now those two words are indistinguishable to a, a screen reader. And so we were trying to figure out a better way to display this so that people would hear it correctly on the screen reader. And we thought if we, if we put it in parentheses, that would help. But actually what it does is read there, paren, t hyphen h hyphen e hyphen i hyphen r, paren, this. In fact, it doesn't read verses, it reads this. So it's important to spell that word out. And so the second example shows that if you just separate the letters, it reads, most screen readers will read that as separate letters. T, H, E, I, R, verses. So this is why it's important to have someone who understands how screen readers work in order to make sure that you use the best uh, wording. So let's get into accessibility and security in particular. As security specialists, we often want to make our products as secure as possible, but I will argue that we want to provide only as much security as is necessary. Introducing unnecessary barriers can be as bad as insufficient security. For example, two-factor authentication can be good for sensitive data like financial or medical, but probably it's overkill for things like my social media site or my book club account. And likewise, long, complex passwords and fingerprints are, can cause people to try to attempt to bypass them because they're so long they don't want to have to deal with it, and that can compromise security as well. So let me give you an example. example. Um, I think CAPTCHA is a really good example of a security um, component. So, you know, what it's trying to do is prove that a user is human and not a bot. That's the goal of the security. And these are usually on forms. And the idea with making the text kind of difficult to read is to thwart the automated scripts. So noise is added to text or the images or any kind of audio. But the accessibility criteria is for it to be easy to read or hear or understand or enter. And trying to meet both of these criteria at the same time can be challenging, and it's probably going to get worse as these automated scripts get more sophisticated. So let's take a look at what they are and what we can do. The traditional CAPTCHA looks like this, and they have, you know, the characters are distorted, there's lines introduced to try to make it harder for these um, machine scripts to, to recognize. But you want to be careful because it can make it very difficult for people with low vision and dyslexia to recognize as well. You want to be careful of low contrast background and foreground colors and also of colors that vibrate because this can be difficult for people with seizures. And so people have tried to make these even harder for machines to understand and they've They've distorted the text even further, and I'm sure everyone here has had the experience where you've run into one of these CAPTCHAs and you can't read the first one, and you have to go through several before you actually get one that works. So this stuff is difficult for everyone, and the question is, is it really necessary to be that difficult? People have introduced audio CAPTCHA as an alternative to video visual CAPTCHA because they recognize that there are people that can't necessarily see them. 
um, but also noise is added to these audio captures for the same reason. And so I just wanted to play a couple here for you to give you an idea how this can work. So this is a this is random interference. C six E P H E M. So you may have noticed that there were noises in there that you weren't sure whether it was actually a character you were supposed to recognize or whether that was part of the background noise. So people have tried to improve that to make it more distinct what the background noise is from the letters. And this is another example. Y nine H T eight. But that one in particular might be a little disturbing to people. So maybe gunshot isn't exactly a good background noise. And this one's very similar, but using a bell. E six J B nine. So those are some examples of audio CAPTCHA. And people have tried to make CAPTCHAs easier for people to understand by using pictures, for example. And you just have to pick out which one is the picture of the flower in this case. But this doesn't lend itself very well to description. But what if you were to use audio sounds like a car engine or water pouring or a clock ticking? And you can see here that this one actually does have a, an audio CAPTCHA as well. But the question is, can we do something even simpler than that? Is it sufficient to just have a simple checkbox on an image? Now this has text on it, but the text is part of the image, and so it makes it harder to be machine readable. But in order to be accessible to the blind, it has to either have an alt text or there has to be an audio CAPTCHA to go with it as well. So anyway, those are, those are some examples of different types of CAPTCHAs, and I would argue that the, the simpler you can make them and still be not readable by uh, the, the automated scripts, the better. So some more uh, accessibility tips. It's always a good idea to have multiple modalities, as I mentioned before, both visual and audio CAPTCHAs. Um, multiple cues don't rely solely on color, for example particularly for people that are colorblind, you want to make sure there are multiple, you know, adding an icon to this can make it a lot more distinguishable. And then, um, again, any options and alternatives that you can provide that help people to customize the experience for themselves to make it better meet their needs, the better. And as far as security goes, you want to make sure, we, we want to try to make sure we don't make security more complex than it needs to be, as I mentioned before. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention about passwords is that if someone is blind and is listening to a screen reader on a mobile device, for example, and they are trying to enter a password with a keypad and they're moving their finger over the keyboard, it's going to read out all of the characters until they get to the one they want, then they click it, and that gets added as the password. So if somebody was listening to a blind person enter their password that way, they might be able to decipher what the password is. So just something else to keep in mind. And when we did the usable introduction to the usable project a couple of years ago, um, we were told that words are actually easier to type, remember and to type than random character combinations. And so trying to come up with you know, just putting four random words together can often be as difficult to crack as random characters, but it's a lot easier to remember and type. And the last thing I want to mention here is a project that Benetech worked on in trying to make long fingerprints easier to communicate to other people. And we developed a product called Authenticon, which is currently just a prototype and isn't actually available to play around with, but the idea here was that you could enter your fingerprint and it would give you a set of icons that would be fewer than the number of characters. Well, a lot of times what people would do here is they would read out the first four characters and the last four characters and then just say, okay, I think you are who I, who I expected, so I'm not going to do the rest of it. It's too time consuming. But if they were able to just look at a set of icons and say, I'm seeing a screw, a viking, a deer, a tape, a chevron, you know, they could read through it a lot more quickly and the other person could verify that that's who they were. So this is the idea of trying to simplify these things 
And just to leave you with the idea that um, if you can think about how to simplify your security without compromising security, we can make it easier for people. So lastly, I wanted to give you some resources that you can look at um, to learn more about accessibility. There is a website at the University of Washington called Accessible University, and that's at washington.edu slash access computing slash capital A capital U. Um, you can go to their website. It, you'll see these examples. There's an inaccessible website and an accessible one, and then there's a list of um, a list of issues that you can read through and figure out, you know, how you might want to improve your own websites or your own products. So in this particular website, you can see the one on the left looks nearly identical to the one on the right. So you don't actually have to compromise your visual design in order to make things accessible. So this website has some menus across the top. It has a carousel on the main portion. It's got some text below that. And then it's got a form on the right hand side. So I just want to go over a couple of the visual components here that you might want to pay attention to. First is the links. So in the inaccessible version, the links are not underlined and the color doesn't change until the cursor moves over it. So it's very difficult for anybody, anybody really to notice that there is a link there. Whereas on the right hand side, the link is not only underlined, so it's visual, but the screen reader is going to read, read more about the Students Engineering Award, which is a cue that there's a link there. And the second thing is the carousel itself. So on the left, we've got a yellow dot versus white dots, which are very difficult to distinguish. On the right, we not only have colors that are very distinct, but also uh, numbers to show you how many items there are in the carousel. Now let's take a look at the form. So on the left hand side, we've got a comment at the top. It says apply now. Required fields are in blue. Now if you're listening to that on a screen reader, you're not going to know which fields are in blue. And even if you can see it, the difference between the blue and the black in this case is very, very subtle. So it's going to be hard to distinguish. On the right, we've got the, it says name colon required. And so it tells you the required fields right in the name of the field. And in addition, we have bold text, which is easier to distinguish visually. And the second one here that I wanted to point out was another CAPTCHA. And I thought this one was very interesting because on the left we have the security test says, please enter the two words you see below separated by a space. Now on the right we have a typical CAPTCHA with the distorted characters with some noise. But on the left we have a phrase, which is minus 72.9 degrees. And as far as I can tell, that's more than two words by itself. So which two words exactly are they looking for? So not only is that visually difficult, it's comp the comprehension isn't good either. It's, very con it's not clear what exactly they're looking for. So on the right, they have a much better security question, which I think is a good replacement for CAPTCHA, for example which is, security question is, Sunday, bird, Friday, which of these is not a day? So it's a very simple question. It does not require a lot of co cognitive ability to answer the question, but it would be difficult for um, an automated script to figure that out. So just something to keep in mind. And one last thing I would mention on the visual portion of this is, if you have a portion of your website that is in a different language, or if you allow people to switch to a different language, be sure that the HTML in your code specifies the voice that should be used for the language. So if you switch to Spanish, you want to switch your voice to a Spanish voice so it uses the proper accent in reading that. You don't want to have Spanish being read by an English or American accent because it will be pretty indistinct. It would be difficult for somebody just listening to that to be able to understand what they're saying. So just another thing to keep in mind. Some other resources, there is the Web Access Accessibility Initiative, um, which is sort of generally about 
web accessibility, and you can read through that. But the more important one is going to be the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And I've got here a link to the summary, which is a good sort of at-a-glance reference card that you can use to remind yourself of things that you should be considering. But then there's also the entire document, which goes into a lot of detail about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and where there are places for exceptions. And lastly here is ARIA, the Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And ARIA is a set of components for HTML that you can add to your code that will address specific accessibility needs. And this is generally not, a, the, your visual users won't notice these things, but for example, if you have a notification that appears on the screen, for somebody who's using a screen reader and they're listening to the screen, do you want that notification to interrupt the text that's being read currently or should it wait until it finishes and then read the text? So you can set those kinds of parameters with ARIA. So those are some resources. Um, and lastly, are there any questions? You can also email any questions to me at dnm at benetech.org. And I will just say thank you very much for attending this webinar on accessibility and security, and I hope it's been helpful. And good luck in implementing this stuff in your products. Thank you very much.